When the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in the summer of 2022, the world changed for a lot of people. By the end of June, more than half of the country's abortion trigger laws were in effect, closing the doors of thousands of abortion clinics and automatically banning abortions in the first and second trimester, especially if they weren't medically necessary. But this story and the long-term outcomes of the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization decision is about a lot more than access to abortion services. And here's why. There are any number of areas in which now become vulnerable, which should make all Americans concerned. We're talking about a nation that baked into its laws the enslavement of a group of people. We're talking about a nation that enacted laws that denied women rights. Um, we're talking about a country that legalized marital rape. That's Michelle Goodwin the Chancellor Professor of the UC Irvine Law School and the author of Policing the Womb. She's an expert in constitutional and health law. In the wake of Dobbs, the Supreme Court has basically dumped a mound of trash for people to be able to sort out, or they've sort of left a hurricane with many things scattered all about. It's basically set the rule of law on fire. The legal implications of the Dobbs decision are still unfolding, but there are some societal impacts that we could start seeing sometime soon. So in 1973, the Supreme Court struck down criminal laws that banned abortion. It was a seven to two opinion, not even close. And what Justice Blackmun and his colleagues on the court wrote in 1973 was that when women lacked autonomy over their own reproductive decision making, this created impediment for the overall flourishing of their lives. Goodwin says those impediments included access to higher education, professional growth, and maternal mortality and morbidity, all things that people are talking about once again. Check out this reporting by my NBC colleague in Washington, D.C., Amy Cho. She talked to a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, who spent five years studying people seeking abortions. When we ask people, why do you want an abortion? The most common reason is that they feel like they don't have the money uh, and resources to provide for a child. And what we see is the right. Women denied abortions were more likely to live in poverty and be unemployed. They often had higher debt, lower credit scores, and more bankruptcies and evictions. The Turnaway study also found that women who were denied abortions had more health issues. They were more likely to stay in contact with a violent partner and were more likely to raise the child alone. But this study received a lot of pushback from opponents of abortion rights. More than 200 groups and organizations signed an amicus brief to the Supreme Court supporting the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and Feminist Choosing Life of New York was one of them. Michelle Sterlace is a lawyer and the nonprofit coalition's executive director. You know, we see abortion as a tool of the patriarchy, as violence. So uh, not seeing that the violence of abortion is um, necessary, it's actually counterproductive, you know, to women achieving equality. We don't need um, to kill our offspring in order to be equal. Studies show that most women who undergo abortion are driven to abortion for economic reasons. And so that's a root cause. So as a pro-life feminist, we want to address those root causes. And that means, you know, doing what we can to alter the social, economic, and political institutions that are hostile toward pregnancy and toward parenting, right? So that I, as a woman, can achieve equality, I can fulfill my dreams, and not have to abort my child. Sterlis says her group provides resource lists for things like adoption centers, food pantries, and women's shelters in New York State. But are those resources enough? In their dissent, Supreme Court Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor pointed out that, quote, above all others, women lacking financial resources will suffer from today's decision. And even before the court's decision, research from the USDA found that a third of households with children and a single mom were food insecure. And if you can't afford a child, you probably can't afford to travel for an abortion. Enter groups like the Midwest Access Coalition. We provide holistic, practical support. And so that's everything from 
booking and paying for train, plane, bus tickets, uh, accommodations. Uh, we provide gas reimbursements, childcare stipends, um, everything to you know make their trip possible to get them to their appointment and back home. It's not just private groups either. Some states and cities are using public funds to help people get abortion services. And so far, New York, Oregon, and California have earmarked millions of dollars so people can travel to get an abortion. My choice. My choice. A full scope of the legal, social, and economic implications of this historic decision are still yet to be seen. But as we continue living in a post-Roe America, it's critical to recognize the impacts that go beyond abortion as they affect us all.